When Keir Starmer confirmed his parliamentary majority, who truly won? Did the voters support Labour or merely defaultly reject the Tories? And what does it imply when a leader, more at home in Davos than in Westminster, purports to reflect the typical Brit? Welcome once more to Crossroads News. Keir Starmer's underprivileged triumph will be discussed in this video together with the severe divisions his leadership has generated inside the Labour Party and the outrage from left-leaning critics as well as moderate right voices. We are exploring the conundrum of an inept prime minister who won without popular support and why his unjustified triumph marks more problems for British democracy. Come explore with us why some call Starmer a traitor. From the fiery left-wing rhetoric of Jeremy Corbyn to a more refined centrist debate, Keir Starmer's climb to the head of the Labour Party signalled a clear turnabout. Some would even argue he veers right, adding a bit of controversy to assist the drug pass. His coronation as leader went beyond mere ideological change. It was about shifting strategies in a game where his forebears wrote in dark ink using shadows. The truth is that Starmer's labor failed to seize control since his clearly moderate programs or pragmatic appeal suddenly captivated the voters. No, the change more reflected giving the Tories the boot than it did a sincere acceptance of Starmer's program. The British people more voted against the Conservatives than they did for Labour. This triumph by default reveals a great dislike of the alternative rather than a fresh love for centrist policies. Labour's ship has stabilised in public view under Starmer's direction. Still bumpy though, the waters it negotiates mirror a political environment still unstable from the aftermath of Brexit and internal party dynamics more erratic than a family gathering following a contested will. Starmer entered a scene devastated by Brexit differences as he avoided Corbyn's more extreme economic proposals. His style has sometimes seemed more about negotiating these gaps with an eye on the next poll or headline than it does about bridging them. Inside the party, there is continuous struggle about its soul. On one side, the Corbynistas, who advocate a return to audacious socialist ideals appealing to the party's grassroots, support. Conversely, armed with the focus groups and pie charts, the Starmerites advocate a course they say is more electable. This internal conflict goes beyond policy to include identity, so members and MPs both should consider whether Labour under Starmer is turning into just another shade of Tory blue. Then there's Starmer's unusual waltz with Davos, regarded by many as a ballet of betrayal. Not only have his inclination for the company of global elites over the harsh realities of Westminster-drawn criticism, but also eyebrows. It was an apparently straightforward question asked during a standard interview. But Keir Starmer's answer would set off something quite different from usual. Emily Maitlis invited Starmer to decide, Westminster or Davos? Um, let us just ask you quickly, you have to choose now between Davos or Westminster. Davos. Why? <laughs> because Westminster is too constrained. Um, and... You know, it's closed and we're not having meaning. Once you get out of Westminster, whether it's Davos or anywhere else, you actually engage with people um, that you can see working with in the future. Westminster is just a, a tribal shouting place. Davos, he responded without a moment to pause. The guy didn't even stop for a second to think. No sitting prime minister from the United Kingdom has ever made such an obviously clear decision and it stands in sharp contrast to a custom whereby British leaders often advocate the historic significance of Westminster. Unprecedented was this inclination for a worldwide economic forum, recognised for gathering the world elite above the national legislative. Regardless of their participation at Davos, past prime leaders always presented a public image that kept Westminster central in their rule. Even leaders like Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, who didn't hold back on the international scene, never underlined Westminster's relevance in such clear terms. There was a quick and broad reaction. Critics from all political backgrounds grabbed the opportunity to criticise what they considered as a compromise of British democratic traditions. The responses presented an image of a leader more fascinated in global networking than in the harsh reality of ruling at home. One can have great consequences from such a posture. In a time when popular confidence in politicians is brittle, supporting an event sometimes attacked for its exclusivity and alienation from the general people only serves to reinforce elitism. Traditionally, a Prime Minister from the United Kingdom has had to balance the local with the global, the international forums with the national debates. Starmer's clear leaning for Davos points to a frightening change. It's difficult not to laugh when the richest people in the world dash into Davos's snowy heights with great proclamations about preserving the earth while drinking good wine. Dubbed the Money Oscars for its ostentatious separation from the real world, the WEF faces criticism and contempt for its parade of wealth under the pretense of concern. By means of its global redesign initiative, the WEF has been pioneering a change towards a concept called multi-stakeholder governance. 
This paradigm avoids traditional intergovernmental decision-making and advocates a setup whereby self-selected stakeholders, mostly from the corporate sector, make decisions free from direct public input or responsibility. According to Klaus Schwab, the WEF is really about promoting peace and wealth for everybody. It sounds admirable, really, but when the same faces, the ones guiding multinational companies and running governments, convene in a luxurious resort year after year, one begins to question, are these meetings about benefiting the planet? Alternatively, are they merely reflecting chambers for the elite to get even more wealthy? Davos is nothing more than a performance exercise, an exhibition of ostensibly worldwide collaboration more focused on safeguarding corporate interests than on addressing actual problems such as inequality and climate change. Davos man has come to be associated with out-of-touch elites more concerned in drinking champagne on a private aircraft than in attending to the urgent concerns of the average citizen. Rebuilding trust is the conference theme this year. Confidence in what? One another? The present? Alternatively, the very systems these elitists defend. Ironically, given widespread mistrust of these so-called answers derived from the higher levels of authority, Schwab and his team could be discussing rebuilding trust, but, for many others, it is quite evident they are the creators of mistrust. While some like Elon Musk find Davos too boring to pay attention to, elitists like Starmer find great appeal in the show. The rest of us are left to negotiate the repercussions while they gather to consider the course of the world over canapes. Davos ultimately serves as a reminder of the distorted power relations in the globe, whereby the few choose for the masses. Though Schwab and his elite friends would want to present an image of cooperation and group effort, the reality is considerably less shiny, particularly since Davos's guy is leading our nation. Starmer's love affair with Davos has anointed him the global elite's poster boy. This stereotype leaves traditional UK voters feeling as frigid as a Davos ski slope in January. Starmer is more than just disconnected. He is in another orbit where billionaires trade climate advice between sips of champagne and where artificial intelligence and robots seem to have more empathy than the working class people back home. It is not only a little blip on the political horizon. No, this is a full-fledged identity crisis for a Labour leader who seems more comfortable talking about high-flying new advances than addressing the breadline problems afflicting his voters. Both conservatives and centrists sneer at the irony of it all. A labour leader who supports the working class by day and hobnobs with globalist tech moguis by night. For our care, who would rather discuss world economics in a luxurious alpine environment, Westminster's brutal arguments seem too ordinary. His home responsibilities and his international ambitions create a conflict that the voters find intolerable and like a terrible taste that won't go away. Dictator Starmer will sell out national interest for a pat on the back from a millionaire benefactor or CEO. Their argument is that this is the ultimate betrayal of the labor values he purports to support. Apart from separating him from his base, the guy's allegiance with Davos has turned him into a parody of the exact forces he previously fought. For people on the right, it's quite ironic. For those on the left, it is worse though. Particularly on the left, where anger simmers not just under the surface but rather shamelessly in the open, Keir Starmer's chairmanship of the Labour Party has surely caused some stir. Once a party driven under the socialist banner and with grand promises of reform, under Starmer's direction it has turned somewhat different. With Starmer's leadership approach and policy decisions generating more than simply political debate, there is a simmering stew of anger threatening to boil over. What are your thoughts on this situation? Let me know down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.